Dear friends and followers, welcome back to my channel and to a very pilot slash flight student related video looking at the question, what information can you derive from the first page of the OFP, the Operational Flight Plan? A big thank you to Cargolux for approving and providing an OFP for this video. It's a long one, but it's full of very helpful information. So let's get started. Uh, Mexico 404 ground. Oddly enough, the gate is not available yet. Continue on Bravo and hold short of November. The operational flight plan, better known as the OFP, is the ultimate tool that every pilot has to have prior and during the flight. Now, the fuel decision and many other important facts are decided upon the numbers on the OFP. When you fly for an airline, a dispatcher will have filed the OFP for you. But let's go through every bit of information listed on the first page of the OFP step by step. First off, we have the ATC call sign. So for that flight, it was Cargo Lux 6606, and the commercial flight number is CV6606. It's a coincidence that they are the same for that flight, but often the call sign is very different to the flight number, including numbers and letters, such as Cargo Lux 43 X ray, as an example. Then the departure and destination airports in the four letter ICAO code format. So that day we flew from Luxembourg to Mexico City. Then the aircraft registration, so Lima X-Ray Kilo Charlie Lima. The flight plan is a scheduled IFR flight and IFR flight levels are being used in the computation. And on the 1st of May 2021 is the scheduled day of departure. Then we have the departure and destination airport in the four-letter ICAO code and the three-letter IATA code with the planned runway. Now, this is important for your fuel planning. The computation of the flight plan might be a few hours back. The wind might have changed at your departure airport, forcing you to fly into the opposite direction of your destination, meaning your flight plan distance is actually longer than what the OFP states, for which you might need a little more fuel. Keep that in mind. Then the estimated off block, takeoff, landing, and on block time, always given in UTC. Then the airplane type, so a Boeing 747-400 ERF or an extended range freighter with four powerful CF6 engines and an estimated block time of 11 hours and 50 minutes. Now the next section is the calculation section dedicated to fuel planning, flight times and weight. So first we have the planned trip fuel to Mexico City given in kilograms. Side note, American OFPs are given in pounds. Then the flight time of 11 hours and 19 minutes and the ground distance in nautical miles, followed by the alternate airport, now in this case Acapulco, which would need another 6.7 tons and 41 minutes to get there at long range cruise speed. Then the mandatory final reserve fuel of at least 30 minutes. Then the contingency fuel, no plane takes off without final reserve and contingency fuel. Now there are various factors that determine the amount of added contingency fuel, 3%, or 5% are often the standard policy, but we got 20 minutes contingency due to the length of the flight. But as I said, this can vary a lot depending on the flight, where you're going, alternate airports, etc. Now, all of these fuel figures added together give you the required fuel. That's the fuel you have to have once you are commencing takeoff. Then the expected taxi fuel to get you from the gate position to the runway. Again, consider your parking position relative to the active runway. Consider the amount of traffic on the taxiways that you don't end up at the runway with less than required, meaning you would have to taxi back and refuel. And then the required plus the taxi fuel gives you the block fuel, which you pass over to the refueling company. Now notify them early enough because refueling nearly 150 tons into the 747 can take up to 30 to 40 minutes. Now, if you do feel that you need a little bit more extra fuel, that's what this line is here for. There are many reasons to take extra fuel, whether at destination, en route weather, traffic at destination, the airspace you fly over, etc., etc. The final fuel decision is entirely up to the crew. There are companies who are very picky about taking extra fuel because extra fuel is extra weight, which increases your overall fuel burn. Believe me, it's a very sensitive topic. 
Now on this particular flight, we couldn't take any extra fuel. Why not? You'll see in a minute. Now over to the weight section, which is separate in three parts. Planned weight, actual weight with lines for you to fill out, and the structural limited weight. Okay, first the operating empty weight. Now picture an empty plane with no fuel, no passengers or cargo, just the crew on board. Then the payload is added, in our case the cargo, which sort of pays for the fuel, so to say. On a passenger plane, it would be the passengers and their luggage. Now, if you compare the number with the structural limit, you see we were only 800 kilos shy of the maximum. Now, those added together give you the zero fuel weight. And that's what it is, the plane plus its payload with zero fuel on board. Now the lines are therefore that you can enter the actual figures derived from your load sheet and compare how much they are off from the numbers on the OFP. If they are above a set limit, investigate. Then we add the block fuel. Zero fuel weight plus the block fuel give you the ramp weight. So the weight you have at the ramp without the engines running. This number, for example, could be interesting for the pushback truck. Then we subtract the taxi fuel to get to the takeoff weight. And again, lines for the actual weight and structural takeoff weight. And as you see, we were pretty close to the maximum takeoff weight, which was the restricting factor for us that day from taking any extra fuel. Understood? And from here, we subtract the trip fuel, which we burn off on our way to Mexico, giving us the planned landing weight. Now, the structural landing weight can very often also be the limiting factor for any extra fuel. The next section gives you valuable information for alternate destination airports, such as the expected runway, the distance to the alternate from your destination airport, the flight level to climb to, the minimum en route altitude to expect in case you have to overcome some high terrain, the true track from destination to the alternate, the average wind component, the M is for a headwind, the P is for a tailwind, the flight time and estimated landing time, the required fuel, and most important info, the reserve fuel. Now the reserve fuel is alternate fuel plus final reserve, meaning this number here, 11 tons, is the minimum fuel you have to have when making your decision at your planned destination airport to divert to your alternate airport. Now let's say you had to fly to your alternate airport. How much fuel do you have left in the tank in case you had to perform a go around at your alternate? Comment below if you know the answer. Below that, you have the expected routings to your alternate, which you should insert into your route two page that you just have to activate it in case you need it. The next section is dedicated for the flight plan routing. Now, what you see here is a shorter version of your ATC flight plan. The full version is a few pages down on your OFP. But this is the file route all air traffic controllers on your route will receive. So starting with the departure airport, followed by the planned runway and the expected SID, which leads onto an airway. So we took off in Luxembourg from runway 06, following the Rapport 7 Tango SID, the standard instrument departure, from which we then joined airway Quebec 763 to Renza. Then all the planned waypoints are listed until the star, the standard arrival route, leading onto runway 23 left in Mexico City. Now the next section shows the vertical profile of your flight, listing the planned flight level steps or descents for the entire routing. Now this profile is determined by many factors, fuel burn, favorable winds, routing, minimum en route altitude, and many, many more. Now, the following section is the performance schedule. We shall climb with a cost index of 67, or a specified speed can be shown here too. Now, this cost index is meant to be flown after passing 10,000 feet, unless ATC clears you to fly free speed, so any speed higher than 250 knots. Then the cruise cost index of 67, which comes active once reaching the first selected cruising flight level. Then the planned descent speed of 290 knots or initially Mach 0.84. Now the descent speed schedule can also be a cost index 
or a fixed speed until reaching 10,000 feet. Cost index itself would take a whole video to describe in more detail. Then on the right hand side we have 5,443 nautical air miles between the origin and destination airport calculated using applicable true airspeeds and wind components. Then the minimum outside air temperature of minus 52 degrees Celsius which will reach at waypoint Nebin. And the average wind component from origin to destination which was not in our favor that day as we had an average headwind of 18 knots increasing our flight time. Next up is the additional data section. Now this is a tricky one. Let's say you want to save on your trip fuel because of persisting weather at the destination airport and you decide to decrease your takeoff weight by one ton, meaning practically offloading payload. You decrease your trip fuel burn by 308 kilograms. The lighter the plane, the less fuel burned. Makes sense, right? But wrap your head around that. 308 kilograms equals 1.5 minutes more flying time. In order for that to make sense, you have to offload a lot of payload. <laughs> now, if you still wanted to put in some extra fuel, yet again because of weather or rush hour traffic at the destination, it states per every ton more trip fuel, so increase, the plane burns 217 kilos more per extra ton. That's what I mentioned earlier. The more extra fuel you load, the more trip fuel you burn because you're effectively getting heavier. Now, the example I'm showing here is actually the return flight as we had some space left for extra fuel. But on our flight from Luxembourg to Mexico, as mentioned earlier, we were takeoff weight limited and it says not available as we were unable to uplift any extra fuel. The next two numbers are interesting if you decided or requested by ATC to fly at lower levels than planned. For instance, if the airway is blocked by another aircraft, so in our example, if we were to fly a thousand feet below the planned routing, you would burn 419 kilos more and it would take you three minutes longer. Two flight levels lower isn't even acceptable because you probably burn so much more fuel that you'll get an insufficient fuel message and won't reach your destination legally in terms of fuel. Next, we have the FMC fuel factor. Now, the FMC has a standard fuel burn value for all 747s, but this is rather theoretical. In real life, the fuel burn varies from airplane to airplane and from flight to flight based on many factors. For example, a ferry flight will have a smaller fuel factor as only minimal bleed air is needed for the air conditioning to cool the main deck cargo compartment, compared to a plane filled with perishable goods which need constant cooling. Another example, 747-8s have engines with so-called performance packages which reduce the overall fuel factor, but nevertheless this factor needs to be inserted into the FMC prior every flight for proper fuel calculations and management. Then there's some space to record the inertial reference system position, which also needs to be noted prior every flight, followed by the calculated takeoff time and altimeter readings for RVSM operations. You need to note these prior every pushback and check that they are within limits. That's why the airport elevation is listed right next to it. Then there's some space to write down the departure ATIS and the departure clearance. The DCL or PDC box is there to write down the received PDC number from your printout. And then finally, the signature line for the operating captain. As you see, there's a lot of information given on the first page of the operational flight plan. The following pages then include the actual routing with waypoints, wind, course, flight level, fuel figures, and many, many more. Let me know in the comment section if you want a follow-up video about the remaining pages of the OFP. Therefore, a big thank you to all the dispatchers out there for collecting the data and making the necessary calculations, providing us with the optimal flight plan and information we need on the OFP. I really appreciate your time and effort you put into the OFPs, making our flights more fuel efficient and safe in regards of alternate planning and overflying permits. That's it for today. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you really enjoyed this video on the operational flight plan. 
Once again, a big thank you to Cargolux for allowing me to use their flight plan. And here's your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check. Activate the notification bell, check. Follow my Instagram account, check. Perform a touch and go at my website, check. And don't forget, a good pilot is always learning. Wishing you all the best, your Captain Joe.